It is that time of the week for the Cubs Weekly Podcast, presented by Wintrust, proud legacy partner of the Chicago Cubs and exclusive home of Cubs Checking. Open online today at wintrust.com slash Cubs Weekly. Elise Meneker, Tony Andraki, Andy Martinez here to break down all the trade deadline action or even lack thereof. I think some surprise the moves that weren't made as well. But as always, let's start with the trivia question. Are you guys ready? Okay, so Tony and Andy, in 2004, the Cubs acquired Nomar Garcia Parra. Remember him? At the trade deadline, they acquired him. How many teams were involved in that deal, and who were they? Oh, man. I I honestly don't remember. I thought it was Cubs and Red Sox. Got two. Yeah, that's two. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was a straight up. I thought it was one. It was for not. Or... You could throw okay. out a number and just see if it's right. Then we I'm going to say go three. From... Or no, I'm going to say four. So yeah. I feel like say it wouldn't four. be asked. I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So good guess. Okay. All right. All right. You have two of the teams. 2004. Were the uh, Dodgers involved? No. Okay. <laughs> one <laughs> one team teams. you one team you can't even think of um, the name today. Like you got to go the back. Expos. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then oh. one think of the central but not nl al twins yeah Sweet. i will I say a little guess <laughs> but for not having a clue <laughs> on this question you guys made good guesses um so other players that they acquired in that deal i'll tell you just because i feel like if we could really be here all day if we guess um matt merton was yeah acquired. i remember that um so Kyle sent me a lot of other great information, but I feel like I'll, I'll leave it at that. I could go through like everything, but I feel like let's keep it simple today. Who did the Cubs give up in that deal? I don't know okay. that. So they have, I'm looking at his, like all, all the four moves. Um, they traded Alex Gonzalez. Right. Okay. Um, and Francis Beltran and Brendan Harris to the Expos. Gotcha. Okay. Um, they traded Justin Jones to the twins. So I'm basically going through all the information Kyle gave me. So here we are anyways. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> they traded Justin Jones to the twins. Um, and then you have, hold on. I want to get it right. You have, yeah. Doug Minkiewicz went from Minnesota oh, yeah, to the, Boston. Right. Okay. And he helped them win that the, in 04. He was, yeah. he was a big part of that team. And Orlando Cabrera went also, from, yeah. Yep, exposed to Boston. So Ooh. there you have it. I don't like you guys. I didn't remember all the moves or even think about all that. So that's what can happen on trade deadline. It can surprise you. And that's what happened for us um, around the league in some moves and with the Cubs. So let's start with the most talked about uh, non-move. And that is with Wilson Contreras and Ian Happ uh, not traded. They remain with the team. So first, Tony, I'll start with you just getting your reaction. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're doing this Wednesday morning, the morning after the trade deadline. If you had asked me Tuesday morning of the trade deadline, what the percentage was that Wilson would be traded that day, I would have said close to 100 percent. I really thought that it was a near lock that he was going to be dealt because he was such a such an impactful bat on the market. There were several teams that needed catching depth, although we saw on like Sunday and Monday, some of the teams that needed catching depth, you know, acquired that like the Astros with Christian Vasquez. But yeah, I just, I really thought that that's how this was going to end. I mean, he obviously thought that too, based off of what he was reading and, and maybe conversations with the Cubs and stuff, but like, you know, his emotional, I guess, farewell, even though it's not a farewell now at Rigby Field, and, you know, even half as well. And like their hug and embrace and the dugout, like all of that was this buildup that like, it almost feels like there was no payoff, but like in a weird way, that's not a, that's not a bad thing. You know what I mean? Like for Cubs fans, now they get to watch Wilson Contreras and Ian Happ for the next two months of this season. We'll see what happens in the off season, but at least right now, Happ is under team control for next year. Wilson, you know, again, we're not entirely sure. Um, but yeah, I was, I was surprised. I was, I really thought that there was going to be like a post five o'clock move that happened. And we see it every year where like some moves trickle out that the moves are officially done, but not, you know, leaked to the press or whatever else. And I thought that might've happened. And then we saw, I think Ken Rosenthal was the first one from the athletic say, you know, the Cubs will not move Contreras and half. And it was like, Whoa, like, I, I don't know. I feel like I'm still processing it to a bit. I, it's, 
But also, I think, like Jed Hoyer explained it, good on him for not trading Wilson specifically for what he deemed as like spare parts, as what he thought was not worth the emotional toll on Wilson, an important player to the organization, an important player to the clubhouse with young guys like Chris Morrell and Nelson Velasquez, but also an important player to the to the franchise, to the fan base. So I, I think good on, on Jed for like kind of sticking to his guns at the asking price. And the Cubs will have a, a comp pick if they extend him a qualifying offer. So it's not like he'll walk for nothing. But yeah, it was overall shocking. Yeah, and I'm right there with you. You know, uh, when uh, you know we were, uh, I was with a bunch of reporters in the Cardinals dugout or in the Cubs dugout at, at Bush Stadium, waiting to kind of hear what happens. And when that Ken Rosenthal tweet came out, everyone's like, "Is this real? Like, is this a burner account? Like, what what's kind of going on?" It was, it was, it was a, a lot of disbelief. I'm right there with you, Tony. You know, I, I was, I was saying, you know, if if I had to put a wager, you know, I would have put a, a big wager that Wilson Contreras would have been dealt. And he mentioned it too after the game. You know, this was a, a somewhat of a learning experience for him. You know, he assumed he just assumed he saw everything that Chris Bryant, Hobby Baez, and Anthony Rizzo went through last year. He assumed he was gone. He was, he assumed he was getting traded, and it was a learning experience that you know, hey, that's not you can't just assume things are going to happen because as we see, anything can happen, and sometimes it's what you think is very unlikely. Uh, he learned about that and he mentioned too you know he's he's totally focused now on just going out and trying to help the team win trying to help the team improve uh, and to me that was uh kind of refreshing and and you saw red array where right where he has that triple his first at bat he almost hits a homer to opposite field the second one he hits the triple to right uh, i mean he he it seems like the switch was like okay you know i'm on the cup like let's try and go out and win tonight uh it doesn't matter what could have happened and and to your point too tony you know it was incredible for for jed hoyer i thought to to stick to to stick to his price and, and not go below it just to trade him for trading sake you know um i, th I think there's uh there might be a little bit of a hesitancy now as we see teams with like the tampa bay rays you, you don't want to trade with the rays we saw what the cubs have done you know with their acquisitions the last year or so uh there might be a little bit of hesitancy that, that you know if the cubs are asking for this guy that you weren't valuing so high maybe you're thinking oh maybe they're maybe they're on to something let's let's hold on to let's hold on to that prospect or something yeah, I think, um, like you said, seeing him too in that game, to see him be able to continue to, whether it's compartmentalize, quickly, you know, move on, whatever it is, um, the product on the field isn't affected. And if not, we're seeing, you know, now like an uptick with all this behind him. I find that to be impressive because I feel like for me, it would still even take a little bit of time because of the buildup, because of the anticipation. And you could just see it in his face and see it in his body language, just, you know, the relief that probably came over him um, when the clock struck five central or six Eastern. So um, yeah, I think for sure surprise as it was getting later in the day, there was a split second where I had a thought, maybe he's not going anywhere. And I was like, nah, that probably won't happen. And then sure enough, um, he isn't moved and neither is half. And um, I think now, like you said, Tony, with the qualifying offer, there's more to it. It's not that you get nothing in return, but I think given his contract situation and the start of the season and just how things have panned out to this point, there was kind of that assumption that he would be on the move. But like you guys are saying, um, Hoyer saying there wasn't something worth the return. So in that case, we're going to keep him and now we'll see what happens moving forward. And I think the whole thing just uh, really intriguing to see how it unfolded, given all the big names that were out there and all the moves that were being made really last minute. And here we are sitting in anticipation, waiting for a couple on the Cubs ends, or we, or we thought a couple more on the Cubs end. And sure enough, um, now the team that, you know, we've been watching is pretty much the team that we're going to be seeing now. But besides the bullpen, you know, this is now the team that we're going to see moving forward. So now I think even for us, we can kind of anticipate, you know, what things will look like and, and the storylines around everything. So with that said, because everyone kind of knows now um, what's happening moving forward, um, Andy, for you, if anything, what does this change uh, with the remainder of the season um, and even to the off season? You know, what are you looking out for? What uh, are what's on your mind now as we are looking at uh, the Cubs for the rest of 2022? You know, it, it, it's interesting because they have a lot of young players. So, uh, you know, when you kind of assume 
you know, like us, like Wilson Contreras assumed that, you know, Wilson Contreras and Ian Happ are potentially getting traded. You start looking at, okay, you know, maybe that means a little bit more playing time for Nelson Velasquez. Maybe that means, you know, if someone like Rafael Ortega had gotten moved, maybe you look at someone like uh, Narciso Crook down in AAA that can get a, a longer look. Uh, PJ Higgins is on the roster. If Wilson Contreras gets, you know, get, would have gotten traded, that's a longer look. Now all those guys, you know, they're kind of back to, to square one for lack of a better term. Uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see how their playing time and development, uh, you know, kind of continues. And for, for Happ and Contreras, you know, the, both of them stress, you know, it's just about tomorrow, especially Contreras said, you know, uh, the, the one thing he knew for certain was that there's a game tomorrow and he's going to try and win. He, he downplayed anything about, you know, looking looking too far ahead. And that's kind of how he's been all season regardless up until, you know, obviously the last week when the emotional toll of everything kind of finally got to him. Uh, so I really I, I think for Wilson specifically, it's it's definitely going to be, you know, hey, you know, go out there and try to win the next day and the day after that and, and not worry about, you know, two weeks from now, or two months from now, uh, what could potentially happen when it comes to, you know, long term extension or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think there's, um, you know, maybe the the kind of glass half empty look is like the Cubs don't get as much time to evaluate young players young pitchers too you know I mean with Hap and Contreras staying there's like around 400 plate appearances now that will go to those two guys that wouldn't go to Nelson Velasquez or Narciso Crook like you said Andy or even maybe even some of the younger guys or other guys that coming up that are not currently on the 40-man roster that we would have seen like how that played out maybe the return of Jackson Frazier or whatever in the big leagues but also I think from the pitching perspective like I'm still pretty surprised that Drew Smiley wasn't traded because he's a veteran lefty who has it will, can give you reliable innings in the rotation. And even if he doesn't crack like a playoff rotation, he proved last year and he's proven in the past in his career that he can go to the bullpen and he helped the Braves win a world series last year as a left-handed veteran reliever. So like, I'm still pretty surprised that that happened, but now, you know, he's in the rotation and like the Cubs are better for it as a team but it's not necessarily a road, you know, there's a rotation spot that's not available for, you know, uh, Wisniewski who they just acquired over the weekend. If he were to come up from AAA or Caleb Killian again, or even to see what the Cubs have in, in Matt Dermody or some of the other guys like Sean Newcomb, who are starting in AAA, at least where you're at right now, like, and see how those guys perform at the big league level again. Like there's, there's just not as much, there's not as many innings. There's not as many plate appearances to go around, but yeah, I, I do think overall, like obviously this team is better than we thought it was going to be. It, with, trading just four relievers is much smaller than I think a lot of people thought this deadline was going to look. So there's not quite as much playing time for young guys, but there's still going to be plenty of time for and, and a you know ability to see what Velasquez has to see you know Morel play all over the field and stuff like that. But but yeah, I. I I think that's the biggest impact is, you know, not necessarily getting a glimpse into the future like they would have before. That being said, Wilson being here and Hat being here is great for the clubhouse for their leadership, what they provide to the team, consistent at bats, you know, leading by example. Like all of that is absolutely a win for the Cubs, for the fan base, for for everybody that's going to be at Wrigley Field the next two months. And I'll give you guys another example, too, because, Andy, like one of the names you mentioned, Narciso Crook who's hitting really well in AAA um, because of the Wilson Contreras situation, John Hicks, he's yeah. a catcher right now here who's hitting really well. Um, Tuesday night, he had two home runs and a double just to give you an example. Um, so he was someone probably um, anticipating, Hey, maybe I'll get a chance uh, with the big league club. He's a guy who has big league experience. Um, but now you'd have to think with the situation, it's just not really, there's, there's no opening. There's no need right now. Of course, what we've seen throughout this season is that with injuries, opportunities arise, anything can happen. So you'd think right now that's the most common way um, to see guys come up or to see new faces, new names. But other than that, I think besides the bullpen, um, because like Hoyer gave the example last year, it was, you know, this gave an opportunity for someone like Efros to step in and rise. And we see now where he is. Um, and so really when it comes to the bullpen, again, that's what you're looking at for guys to step up. Um, who are guys that we're going to see, but um, for, in terms of, you know, positional players, it really is, you know, like you said, Tony, kind of what we've seen in the rotation as well. Um, so I think for that reason too, it's exciting because we haven't gotten that much consistency in the first half because of injuries. And so now um, if we can see these guys um, play together over a period of time, I think it'll be cool to see how they come together. So I think for the most part, you know, now the exciting thing is 
who we're going to see on the field and the more consistency that we will get uh, from those players. Um, Tony, including like a guy from Wilson Contreras, he can settle in. Yeah, for sure. I mean, he, he like he said the other, you know, last night after everything happened that he can breathe a sigh of relief. It's a weight off his shoulders. But I think one question too that Cubs fans have, and I've seen it on social media, I've had friends text me about it is, does this make the Cubs more likely to sign, you know, Wilson to an extension? I don't know that that's true. I don't know that there's, that he's really any more likely or at least significantly more likely to sign an extension with the team than he was if they had traded him away and, you know, would have, would have come back uh, in free agency or something like that. Like he does have that potential compensatory pick uh, attached to him now in free agency for the qualifying offer. The Cubs are going to extend it. That would be silly not to from their end, but yeah, you know, I don't know what he gets on the open market and, and I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, teams weren't willing to give up a huge haul for him at the deadline this year. That doesn't mean that they won't want to give him a hundred million dollar contract or whatever in free agency. But yeah, in general, I don't know that this really changes much in that calculus, it, whether the Cubs want to sign him long term or not. I think, you know, always it depends on price. The Cubs obviously like him as, as a catcher, as a player, as you know, his personality, his fire, his competitiveness, all of that three time all star catcher. Like, what do they not like about it? But just also the fact that, like, if the price is still higher than what they deem, you know, to, to want to pay for that position, especially given where they are in this kind of retooling process, I don't know that things have changed. So um, it, maybe it's a little more likely because he's here for the next two months and, and maybe he realized like how much, you know, he enjoys playing here, but I think he knew that before. So like, I don't think he's really necessarily going to give them any sort of discount or whatever. So I don't know, I guess I'm kind of curious your thoughts too. Like, do you guys think he's any more likely to sign for, you know, beyond 2022 than he was prior to like the deadline. I don't um, think this, yeah, yeah I don't think it, I'm right there with you, Tony. I don't think this changes anything in, in terms of, you know, whether or not it meant, like, I don't think it's an A equals B type thing, right? Like it, I think yeah. they were both independent of one another uh, and it just so happens he happened to stay. Um, I, I guess the, if you, if there's anything, maybe there, there's that extra two months where they can talk now, if theoretically for an extension. So, Maybe in that sense, yeah, maybe it is a little bit more likely, but I don't think it, 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 it meant like him not trading like, yep, that's guarantee extensions coming. I, I don't think that's necessarily the case. Yeah, um, Jed Hoyer, did, you know, after the whole deadline was asked about it and just kind of left it at that, that that'll be something that they figure out moving forward. I think I'm with you guys more than anything. I now just look at the qualifying offer because um, you look at when the trade deadline was coming, the idea was, if you trade Contreras, what do you get in return, right? And that's what Hoyer was saying, that what we were going to get in return, we didn't feel was worth or what we were looking for. And so attached to that qualifying offer is a potential, you know, pretty high round pick. So that's what now you're looking at is, is either Contreras the return or a pick. And so I think that's now, um, you know, the two options that you're looking at. And uh, I'm, yeah, I don't know, um, but I, I think I'm with you guys um, that I don't, I don't think it necessarily means just like you said, any A equals B. So um, we'll see. But actually, I mentioned what Hoyer had to say um, yesterday after the deadline Tuesday. So let's hear more from him right now. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that, you know, I guess we're trying, trying to trying to add power arms in, in, in every deal, you know, and that, that was the biggest focus. You know, those are those are guys we had targeted. Um, you know, obviously, the, you know, the most high profile guy you know, was Wes Neski. And, um, you know, we, we, we love the fact that, you know, it's a, it's a four pitch mix. Um, he's already competed, you know, in triple a at, at a high level. And, and, um, he was a guy that we had had discussions about him going back a ways and, and Brown was as well. We'd had, he, he had come up another deal. So it was interesting that the guys that we, that we ended up grabbing are, are players that, you know, had come up previously, um, with those teams in, in different discussions. And, you know, sometimes that familiar familiarity helps to, to do deals, but, um, I'm looking forward to getting all those guys and, um, you know, Cubs uniforms at various levels. We'll, we'll have, we'll sit down after this and we'll sit down with uh, player development, talk through the, their plans and, and where we want to go with them. But, um, listen, I'm, I really feel good about where our system is right now as a whole. Um, I think we're really deep. I think we, we've, we've continued to get deeper through a good draft and through, through the deadline. And, and obviously, you know, last year we acquired a ton of prospects and I'm really proud of, you know, where we've come in, in one year, I think the depth of our system from you know, kind of the beginning of last, you know, kind of like last winter to, 
to now, I think the depth of our system is just immeasurably better. And um, I think that bodes exceptionally well for the future. Oh, yeah, he's a really versatile uh, young player. Uh, we, had, we had talked to the Dodgers throughout the year about him, uh, never quite lined up on value um, during the course of the year. And then, uh, you know, when, they, when we talked about Chris Martin in that context, it made a lot of sense. Um, I think he'd be sort of blocked um, in, the, in their system. But, uh, yeah, he's a re- really versatile, versatile player, you know, left-handed bat. And um, I think we can give him real opportunity. And, uh, you know, I don't, or given the kind of opportunity, I don't think he was able to get with the Dodgers this year. All right. So there, Hoyer kind of gave you a rundown of his reaction, his feelings as to how things went. So now we're going to talk about it. We're going to lay it out for you and recap it all. So probably not as many names as you expected, but there were a few. So um, to start things off, Scott F. Ross actually probably came the most notable player traded or the most surprised player. And he was uh, he went to the Yankees for Hayden Wesnevsky, who is a triple A pitcher who has really good numbers. He is a top 10 prospect for the Yankees, number seven. Um, So that right now is one of the highest returns in these trades. Chris Martin was the first trade mate. And in return um, from the Dodgers, uh, we got Zach McKinstry. The Cubs got Zach McKinstry. So um, infielder who we saw start Tuesday night for the Cubs. And uh, Michael Gibbons went to the Mets in return. The Cubs received Saul Gonzalez, a right-handed pitcher, and uh, David Robertson, a name that was thrown out there, did get traded, went to the Phillies, and Ben Brown, a right-handed pitcher, received, uh, or the Cubs got. So with all of that said, um, Andy, I'll start with you. Um, Just kind of names, what stands out to you, just, you know, anything that kind of jumps out. Uh, I think for me right away was this Scott Efros deal. Um, you know, when I got the the push notification, when I saw it on Twitter, I'm kind of like, this, this is a typo, right? Like they had to, that like this was the wrong name. I, I didn't <laughs> think Scott Efros was, was, uh, was the, was a player that was going to be traded. You know, when you looked at the bullpen, you know, obviously you knew Robertson, Martin and Givens, just given their track record and their success this season, that that, that was a real possibility. Scott Efros, you know, being a, you know, a younger player in terms of, of, you know, your MLB experience and, and still only 28, like you, you didn't think he was going to be high up, you know, but after a second to kind of like digest the deal, it makes a lot of sense, right. You know, they, they clearly the Cubs have a confidence in what they can do in developing pitching nowadays. I mean, we see it with Scott Efros, we see it with Brandon Hughes, we see it with Justin Seal, we see it with Keegan Thompson, you know, it can go on and on with some of these guys that they've brought up through, through their own system. Um, and, and so, they're, they're confident that they can find, you know, another right-handed bullpen arm. There's not to discredit anything that Scott Efros has done because he's, you know, he's made an appearance in every single inning this year. He picked up his first save. Like he, he's been a very valuable piece to the bullpen. Um, but, you know, that that shows the confidence that the Cubs have in their pitching infrastructure that they can develop pitching. And, and we've seen it, you know, from a veteran standpoint too, right? Last year, uh, the, the bullpen of Tapera, Chafin, and Kimbrough. Kimbrough's obviously, you know, a potential future Hall of Famer, but Tapera and, and Chafin were kind of unknowns when the Cubs acquired them and, and they beca- became studs. Uh, we saw that with Martin and Gibbons too. So you, it, it's it, the, the 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 ability to, to create, to, for lack of a better term, to create a bullpen on the fly has been something that has been pretty, something the Cubs have done pretty, pretty well. So to be able to get a starting pitching prospect that, you know, uh, it was already a triple I could potentially come into the majors, you know, this, this year, if not most likely next year is a huge, huge return. When you think about it for, for Scott Efros, uh, and, and it is a testament, I think, overall to just not only, you know, the, the, the ability to make a deal, but also to, to the pitching infrastructure to create, to, to, to be able to, uh, develop pitching. Yeah. I'm on the same boat, Andy, I think, you know, pitching is my main takeaway. Like the Cubs obviously feel extremely confident in that pitching infrastructure and development system they have in place with Craig Breslow, you know, in the minor league system. And, and then obviously at the big league level with Tommy Hadovy and Chris Young and Daniel Moskis and stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, to, you know, Efros certainly surprised me too. I, I was like the same way, Andy, I was like, this can't be real. Like, is this something that, you know, they're just talking about this? And it was like, no, bam, like it was a deal and it was confirmed pretty quickly, but, you know, to get Wesneski and Brown, and I'm really curious to see what Lance Brazdowski's updated Cubs uh, prospect rankings are going to look like for us. But like, I imagine both Wesneski and Brown are probably in the top 10 or at least sniffing the top 10. So to get two top 10 pitchers for, you know, David Robertson, who is a complete unknown 
six months ago. And then Scott Efros, who wasn't an unknown six months ago, but it was like, okay, this 28 year old pitcher coming off of the first 15 to 20 innings in the big leagues, like what's he going to be moving forward? That's really good. That that's huge. And, and I think the nice part about Wesneski and people were surprised by Efros. I was surprised by Efros, but the, the floor here, I think from Wesneski from the Cubs perspective is Efros, you know, is, is like a guy who could be this multi-inning reliever. He's four years younger. He's pretty close to the big leagues. But I think the ceiling is a starting pitcher, a valuable starting pitcher who throws four or five, six times as many innings as a a reliever like Efros would. So, yeah, certainly I think that the Cubs, you know, bet big on their pitching development. Um, You know, Ben Brown also looks like a pretty legit prospect as well. And then McKinstry just helps. They needed left handed bats like that's as simple as it as it gets. One, he's also like there's that. And then two, he's been like around winning. And he's seen the Dodger system. He's seen the way things go about it there. So even though he's a little bit older at 27, like he can play all over the field. He can at least be a, a left-handed David Bodie type of player. And then there's upside for more. Like he never got an opportunity in the big league. So I'm really curious to see with more playing time, with more run- runway, if he's able to develop into like at least a left-handed platoon guy or more than just kind of a, a utility role. So yeah, overall, I think it was interesting. Uh, but like to your point, at least, like I started writing down who the Cubs are giving up and who they're getting in return. And I, you know, kind of did that last year. And it was like, I thought there were going to be a lot more names than eight total than like four one for one deals. So it was definitely surprising uh, just in general, I think, but that being said, the Cubs definitely strengthened their system and strengthened their future with the, with these deals. Yeah. And uh, I would say too, when you were talking about F Ross, probably outside of maybe even Chicago. He's not that well known of a pitcher. I'm not sure people know who he is, even though he has pitched really, really well and deserves to have his name more out there. And now it is. Um, but that's kind of how well he's been pitching to the point where he was on, you know, the Yankees radar and rightfully so, and a very fun guy to cover and now, you know, on a contending team. So um, wish him a lot of success, but now, like you said, in return, the prospects that uh, we got or whether they're major league ready, um, that's the fun part. That's the fun part to watch them grow, to see how they develop. You see the theme of the pitching between drafting 16 pitchers, now picking up more in a trade, how quickly the narrative can change, right? Where just like last year, I feel like we were all talking about the struggle to develop pitching in the CUD system. And now um, all the pitchers that we can list off, they've developed at Ross, one of them. And of course, the two most notable that we see in the rotation with Thompson and Steele. So um, yeah, I think this was part of the anticipation of the trade deadline. What would this team look like after it? And while on the field right now, it hasn't changed that much. There's still a lot of anticipation as to what the prospects will look like and how this team will look in the future. And like you said, even let's, let's see an updated version of the prospect rankings and how um, this was impacted. So we're going to be right back. We're going to go to this commercial break and wrap up the podcast, talking about some more trade topics. We know you love Chicago. You devour the pizza, admire Chicago's skyline, and cheer on Chicago sports teams, especially the Cubs. If you wanted to live in a more boring place, you'd live in St. Louis. Why not bank with Chicago's bank too? Upgrade your wallet with an exclusive Wintrust Cubs debit card, which you can get when you open a Wintrust Cubs checking account. Show your Cubs pride and open an account at Wintrust.com slash Cubs. Member FDIC, equal housing lender. All right, we're back here on the Cubs Weekly Podcast. Elise Meneker, Tony Andraki, Andy Martinez, and guys, uh, we were just breaking down all the Cubs trades all in the bullpen. So with that said, it means there's some holes to fill. So um, Andy, I'll start with you. Who now are you looking at that needs to step up? Just overall, you know, I, I'm looking at some of the younger players. Just overall, I guess it's kind of a cop out answer not picking a, a one specific player, but <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, yeah, Definitely, I, I agree. Guess That's we're a probably gonna all end right, up naming right. all of them though at some point. Yeah. <laughs> right. So then I'm gonna go with Zach McKinstry, uh, as Tony mentioned before the break. Um, you know, he was you know, a left handed bat that the Cubs really had been missing, you know, uh, 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 up until you know the they acquired him it was ian happ and and rafael ortega and then Al- alfonso rios before he was optioned back to iowa were the only you know left-handed options uh for, for the cubs zach mccountry fills that role and it, i think it's almost a compliment to christopher morrell right where you know christopher morrell had to play against tough righties a lot of times just because uh you know that they, they didn't have the the necessary left-handed bats and the versatility defensively uh to to, to cover uh and now they have that with zach and country right yeah we saw it actually in the first game of the deadline christopher morrell gets a gets a day off after or against uh adam wainwright a, a tough righty 
Uh, now you see Zach McKinstry starting. I think that's going to create some lineup flexibility for David Ross. And, and Zach McKinstry, I think, has been, uh, you know, Jed Hoyer mentioned he was blocked in L.A. We know how talented the Dodgers are. Zach McKinstry, I think, is, it could, has the potential to be a really, really nice player for, for the Cubs. Yeah, for me, I'm looking at the bullpen. I mean, you, know, you trade away four, well, three veterans and then Efros, who was, you know, arguably their their best relief pitcher beyond Robertson this year. Obviously, it means there's a lot of room for guys to step up. Rowan Wick is probably the de facto closer now, but he's had his ups and downs this year. So I think he absolutely needs to step up and kind of lock down, you know, even if it's not the ninth inning, like the eighth inning role, like he's the most established guy down there now. But then, yeah, you know, Stephen Brault's a veteran. Brandon Hughes has looked good. Uh, we're seeing what uh, Eric Ullman has, is he's looking pretty nasty so far, you know, 26 year old who's only thrown a, a few appearances, but then other guys, like, I'm really curious to see, you know, if like Cam Sanders comes up and at least I know you've seen him down in triple a, but like he's switched the bullpen recently and, you know, almost touching triple digits down there. And our friend Alex Cohen, I know has tweeted about him recently. So like Sanders is somebody I'm looking at. And then Andy, a point that you've made a decent amount on recent podcasts is, are the Cubs going to start having some of these guys, whether it's Killian or Wesneski, come up in the bullpen? Because right now the rotation is kind of full, and that's weird to say that, but, like, Samson's pitched well. Smiley, obviously, is still here, and Wade Miley's even coming back too. So unless they feel they want to, you know, limit Keegan Thompson or Justin Steele's innings or something like that, I don't know that there's a ton of room for starters, you know, again, barring an injury too, over the final two months. So maybe Killian comes up and works in the bullpen. Maybe it's Wesneski. Maybe it's some of these other arms – that we see, you know, I mentioned Matt Dermody and, and Sean Newcomb before, or maybe it's Ben Leeper who we've heard about, you know, an undrafted guy, but either way, I'm really curious to see who emerges from the bullpen because it's like, you know, to use Adrian Sampson's phrase from last year, it's like game of Thrones. It, it's, it's <laughs> up for grabs right now. And really I would say beyond like Wick Hughes and probably Brault, I, I think there's like five plus spots that like are possibly, you know, at least interchangeable and can be used. And then Michael Rucker's another guy into your guy, uh, I know you like talking Star Wars with him, but like Rucker's <laughs> a guy who's been up here and established. He needs to step up too, I think, and really kind of um, take his game to the next level, like Efros did last year, and become a part of the bullpen of the future. He has two months to prove it now. And it's funny because I feel like our first podcast, one of our first, Rowan Wick, I think we were all in agreement. We were thinking it was going to be the closer. Yep. Um, so here we are where that's probably what he's looking at now, the remainder of the season. And like you said, Tony, with ups and downs, a chance for him to step up and be more consistent. I think the two names that stick out to me right now in the bullpen, Brandon Hughes, um, I think he's proven that he can be a, potentially a higher leverage guy. Um, and Eric Allman has really good stuff. Like you said, came from Iowa and now getting his chance in the big leagues. And I think he's an exciting pitcher to keep an eye on. A name that I'll mention that isn't Cam Sanders that's in Iowa right now is Matt Dermody. He's actually been a really good starter here in Iowa. Um, more experienced pitcher. And while he is a starter and can give that length just because we don't know what happens, I'll kind of put that name out there. So over time, if he's someone who does pop up and I've kind of heard of him, know that he's doing well and potentially could get a shot. So for me, I think it's just looking at the bullpen. I feel like positionally um, a couple of additions or really one addition, but um, overall it's looking like that, that part. And even like you said, surprisingly the rotation, even as much as in flux that has been. Um, so now we'll just see um, pitching wise, really. Uh, how guys um, take advantage of their opportunities, which has been a theme of this season. And a lot of guys have done a really nice job. So with that said, um, we've kind of hinted at it, but now we're going to make a choice. Andy, we're making a choice. No, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> but Tony, I'll start with you. Um, what surprised you the most about the Cubs deadline? I feel like there's two names we're either deciding between, and I'll just say I'm Contreras or Afros. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, they did, but. Um to go back to a point that I made before and I can let you guys talk about Wilson and the surprise and Efros yeah. and stuff there but like I really am surprised that Smiley wasn't dealt or even Miley too because he's rehabbing and we just see how many pitching injuries there are around the game and these are two you know veteran like reliable lefties Miley obviously has been injured and on the IL separate three separate times this year so I understand the concern there but we saw like Matthew Boyd it hasn't pitched at all this year and he was traded at the deadline around the league. And there are just, you know, there were a ton of moves for pitching at this deadline, more than I feel like I can remember. And, and teams just stockpiling arms. So I'm pretty stunned that those two guys did not move. I don't, I have no idea, you know, whether it was just like 
the asking price wasn't there or whatever else. But yeah, I mean, and I also just never saw Smiley's name particularly in any trade deadline rumors leading up to it. So um, that that was really the biggest surprise to me, I think, is is that I kept waiting for that to happen. You know, the Wilson thing, I think we all understand, but like, I don't think the Cubs are extending a qualifying offer to Smiley or Miley at the end of the season. So, you know, they, they're, you know, there's the potential obviously to like resign those guys, bring them back, whatever else. But that shocked me. I, I really thought some team would have, would have paid for that. I thought those at least Smiley was a guy that would have joined a contender, given them innings and then maybe moved to the bullpen for the playoffs. And there wasn't a lot of starting pitching on the market. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for me, yeah, I'll go with the safe, but the Wilson Contreras, I mean, it really was, I mean, the, the mood it just around Bush stadium was, was kind of, was, was just shocked as belief, whatever, whatever, you know, whatever phrase you want to use it, that that's what it was. And uh, you know, I wrote about it on marquee sports network.com Wilson's reaction where, you know, him and Hap are the the only ones in the in the Cubs clubhouse while the rest of the team's out on the field taking BP or, or playing catch whatever they need to do uh and then David Ross walks in at, at you know after the deadline uh, uh and says you know hey you guys aren't traded that you know that, that's the end of it uh and they, they embraced you know I mean that to be a fly on that wall you know that would have been really cool to kind of just experience that moment but it, it, I mean it was really really shocking because we like like Wilson had said last night and and like we've alluded to we were kind of almost trained to think that yep it, it's a foregone conclusion he was going to create it but as we've learned uh and we will probably continue to learn uh baseball is very unpredictable and sometimes you get you think you have a fastball right down the middle and it, <laughs> it breaks and, and it falls in the dirt and you're you're swinging and missing for me, um, there were two trades that I was like, whoa. And one, when I looked down at my phone, I saw that Scott F. Ross was traded. Uh, really wasn't expecting that one. And the other one was not Cubs related and it was Hater. So um, for different reasons and on different levels, obviously, in terms of players. But um, I, I think it was that one. And um, I feel like Contreras and Hap were surprising, but because it was getting so late and nothing had been done, I, at some point you were just kind of like, it was more so really, is this, is this, app? is it not what's, and then you kind of just got your answer. And I feel like that's more to um, what everyone was waiting for, including those two guys, just what's, what's going to happen. So I think definitely surprise with Contreras, but because there was the anticipation of it happening and then it was just that it didn't for me, the, the surprise element um, more so looking at my phone was like an Efros trade, uh, no surprise or not really a surprise that Juan Soto was traded, especially as we got closer to the deadline that became clearer that that was happening with a player like that. Um, once in a generation, really at his age, um, the control you have and caliber of player, a lot of teams or top teams, meaning, you know, the ones who really could, could lay it all out there, had the prospects were in the running for him. So with someone like that on the market, Tony, how do you think that affected um, guys like Contreras getting traded or not traded? Honestly, I think it affected a lot, you know, because the Padres were arguably the most desperate team at the deadline. And I don't mean that in any sort of, you know, negative connotation. Like I think they were aggressive and they were, they're trying to get, yeah, you know, I don't think they've ever won a world series, right. In franchise history. So like, so to, to try to get there and to acquire Soto, I mean, it was the Padres, but any other team, like they don't want to move to a plan B like Hap or Contreras or whatever else to impact their offense until they figure out for sure if they're in on Juan Soto, this once in a generation, you know, 23 year old who has been the best hitter in the big leagues over the last three seasons. Like they they had to figure that out. But also I think the Cubs and Padres have made a bunch of moves recently. Like we saw it last deadline, Jake Marisnik going there for Anderson Espinoza. Obviously, the U Darvish deal was a it was a big blockbuster uh, prior to the 2021 season. I thought the Cubs and, and Padres would have matched up well, possibly even for Contreras and Hap, or maybe for a reliever. We saw the Hater thing, like you mentioned, at least uh, may have taken them out on like Robertson, but Contreras would have helped their offense and their catching, and they needed some outfield help too. You know, the Padres need some more production out there, so Hap would have made a lot of sense. So I could have seen a scenario where if the Padres did not land Soto, they may have pivoted to, to the Cubs and, and gone after Hap, maybe Contreras too, you know, this package deal and given up one or two of their top prospects for it. So yeah, I do think that it impacted the Cubs a lot. And I also think it impacted the market, not just the Cubs, because everybody around the league was, like I said, was trying to figure out what was going on with Soto and trying to figure out 
who is getting him, you know, what they wanted to do with their prospects before they, they delivered, you know, before they got that answer, they weren't able to move on and pivot. And since that just happened, you know, six hours or whatever, before the deadline, there was a lot to be done after that. And ultimately I, I think it played a major factor in Wilson and Hap not moving at the deadline. And I think the biggest effect that, that the Soto deal had for the Cubs is, is what's happening moving forward where he, he wasn't traded to the Cardinals. Yep. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the Cardinals were definitely a, a candidate to, to acquire Juan Soto. And, you know, I, I, you, we saw kind of what Albert Pujols did when he was coming up, you know, against the Cubs. You didn't want to see that if you're a Cubs fan. You didn't want to see Juan Soto doing that for, three plus, for two and a half or three plus years, whatever it is uh in, in a cardinals uniform uh david ross was asked about it he mentioned he, he's glad he won't be seeing him in the division um it, it obviously makes the, the padres a more loaded team and it'll be fun to see them competing against the dodgers but uh it, it was it was incredible to 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 for, for the cubs perspective from the cubs perspective excuse me uh to see juan soto not go to the cardinals because that would have been you know very very difficult and, and to your point tony too you know i mean obviously i think that that changed the market completely right where um, because it it did happen relatively late, and if teams were trying to pivot, it, it it's it makes it tough to try and make make moves for for someone like an Ian Happ or Wilson Contreras when you were trying to figure out you know what's going on with Juan Soto. That was the, that was the first domino that kind of needed to fall from a position player perspective to just to kind of set the market. And Marcus Stroman even jokingly tweeting, <laughs> yeah, like no pitcher. He said, like, yeah, I want to face Juan Soto. Said no pitcher ever yeah. Um, yeah. when you're talking about him not going to the Cardinals. And that was also my impression when Hater left the division. So um, you have a couple, you don't get Juan Soto, and Hater no longer is here, as we know, has uh, always been tough for the Cubs and had anyone in baseball to hit him. Um, so, yeah, and the Hoyer even said that, um, you know, maybe it held things up a little bit or affected things a little bit, but he felt overall that um, things are working closer to the deadline or that's how things seem to be trending. And I think too, with the draft being later this year, I also feel like that was just kind of something as well in the background. There had to be a lot of focus there before transitioning um, to what could happen in the market. So, yeah, I mean, of course he was the biggest name out there and a lot of the talk centered around him and rightfully so and where he would end up so that whether it dictated, you know, the conversations or the market. Um, but, you know, we are here today where we're looking at Juan Soto went to the Pirates, um, Josh Hader, and, or I said the Pirates, Padres. I'm sorry, the Padres. That would, be crazy. That, that would be crazy. That would be crazy. <laughs> That would have been quite a move. Yes. Also in the central, so let's get that out of there. <laughs> but yeah, the other the P name team, the Padres, um, and they they're stacked that with eight or two. So, um, what an eventful trade deadline. We anticipated it last week. It totally looked, you know, so different than what we were anticipating. Uh, but here we are today on August third. It is behind us. We are moving forward. And it was fun to talk about with you guys. So next week, I don't even know what we're going to talk about. We knew this was coming up. Now we're just going to have to see what the week holds. Um, but that'll do it for this edition of the Cubs Weekly Podcast presented by Wintrust. Don't forget to download and subscribe to the pod on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. And check us out in video form on the Marquee Sports Network app and YouTube. For Tony and Drackey and Andy Martinez, I'm Elise Meneker. We'll see you guys next week.